Treasurer Riley Moore, candidate for Congress as well. Riley, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Uh, are you back home for the uh, the week? Is that what's up? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just you were local. I am just here today. Uh, we're, we have a, a couple um, things that we're doing here in terms of uh, unclaimed property presentations. One to the uh, Berkeley County Police Department. We do our annual gun auction mm -hmm. uh, where we auction off firearms that are no longer in use or are going to be destroyed uh they generally they w what they would do is they clear out evidence lockers once cases have been adjudicated and all that and they destroy the firearms we came up with this firearms auction where we get uh, the different weapons from all over the uh, state of west virginia all the different police departments and then we'll auction them off. And for anybody listening here right now, you have to have an FFL, Federal Firearms License, to be able to bid on this. So it's not just anybody can bid on this. Um, it's also uh, when they take firearms from like drug dealers and stuff like that. So we'll auction those off and then all the proceeds go back to the police department. And then they buy different equipment that they need that uh, might not be budgeted for since they're always running on pretty tight budgets. Any idea the size of the check today? Well, you're going to have to wait and see. That's a surprise. <laughs> oh, all right. I'm going to ruin the surprise. He's not going to let you know that, Rob, in yeah. advance. It's my job to ask questions. Indeed. It's Indeed your choice it to answer them or not. That's right. Right? Uh, before we go further down into uh, some of that kind of stuff, let's talk about the House of Representatives, which you wish to join, by the way, and I'm not sure why anybody would want to join that mess right now, but you have, uh, you've made that decision, and um, maybe we're on a path to a speaker now? What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Um, from my understanding, talking with a few of the members of Congress, um, even outside of our delegation, and uh, different folks down there. I think it looks like Mike Johnson of Louisiana is going to be able to get the votes and they are going to head to the floor today. And uh, there seemed to be a lot of uh, unity uh, when he gave his speech there last night in conference. And uh, it does seem that he might be able to get over the hump. He is headed into obviously a pretty difficult situation, I would say. Uh, the oh, yeah. federal government's going to run out of money here uh, shortly. So how the speaker designee, he's not the speaker yet, uh, would navigate that, we're going to see. Is there going to be another CR continuing resolution or something like that. Obviously, I hope not. I hate those things. I don't like CRs at all. Uh, but they're pretty far back on the appropriations bill and bills, pardon me, and going through regular order, which was one of the things that uh, the conservatives and like myself want to see and really just anybody and just a good governance mechanism tool. I mean, to go through regular order, that's what they're supposed to be doing is they're doing their job is voting on these 12 appropriations bills. But I'm not sure how they're going to get through those, but maybe he's got an idea how to do it. I guess we're going to see. Billy. Yeah. Uh, good morning, uh, Riley. I think it's very interesting time we're going through now. Uh, and and hopefully we will get a speaker for long. But I'm less optimistic than you are. Now, admittedly, you you were there yesterday. You know these folks a lot better than I do. I'm here, I, I learn them through third hand, through the media, or through uh, reading about them on the computer and the like. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, seems like there's a couple of factions that are, uh, that are going up. It's the President Trump's influence is loud and clear. That's what cut down uh, 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 the gentleman yesterday. Uh, but the Trump, there's also an anti-Trump faction there as well. And they see that Johnson is is a mimic, if you will, of Jim Jordan uh, without the reputation that Jordan has. Very conservative against any money for Ukraine and the like. I wonder, and all there can be is uh, four holdouts that would keep him from getting uh, being elected. Uh, I find in as diverse as the House is right now that there's not at least four sitting there that's going to take exception for someone as conservative as what Johnson is. And before I turn it over to you, the question, there's another faction as well to it. If they do not get Johnson through, they're beginning to think more and more of getting the temporary speaker, mm -hmm. speaker pro term, Tim, which everybody seems to like real well as a backdrop, or the 
the horrible words in the terms of the uh, Freedom Caucus members working out some agreement with the Democrats, both of which would get us get us in the direction that we could have a speaker. Your comments. I'm sorry for a rambling question. Yeah, no, no, no problem at all. Um, you, now, one of the things to understand about Mike Johnson is what I think he's how he's made a name for himself. First, um, it's as a social conservative, which I certainly support everything that he's been in support of over the years. He was also the chair of the Republican uh, <clears throat> pardon me, study committee, which is a conservative organization, caucus within uh, the Republican conference, which is larger, actually, than the Freedom Caucus, which he is a member of the Freedom Caucus as well. He's generally pretty well thought of. Uh, he's not been somebody who's tried to just burn things down to burn it down. He does have principled positions and points. I, I do think that he could be the guy to get over the hump, but you make a good point. Look, you got a few people that say, we don't want to do this, then it's All not, you need is a few. Yeah, then, it, then <laughs> it's that, not going to happen. And that few is as small as four, which right. is which is troubling it's very troubling trying to get get we're basically talking about unanimous consent and that's hard to do in this day and time it is apparently unless you're a democrat so uh that's they, true they don't seem to have that problem. they don't have that problem <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. People, people fussed about nancy pelosi but nancy pelosi ran with a tight grip so she did everything behind closed doors so did not have this dysfunctional appearance that we see with the republicans yeah i mean look we're we are just more individualistic obviously we have a more diverse caucus than the democrats clearly in terms of uh, ideology and thought and how we look at the world uh democrats are kind of just lockstep in one mind and top down and kind of ruled with an iron fist so uh, you know I do think Mike Johnson would be a great speaker. I sub, you know, certainly would be supportive of him uh, as speaker. If I'm elected, he would come uh, back up in 2025. Obviously, you got to see what kind of job that he does. But uh, from what I know about him and what I've seen uh, over the years, I, I like him quite a bit. I think he's a good one. Maria? I'm going to change gears a little bit. <laughs> sure. How do you balance... Your job as treasurer with obviously running for office a year and a half early. Sorry, I made that comment. Or not a year and a half, a year, whatever. Um, how do you decide Primaries where in less you than spend, seven months. <laughs> yeah, where you spend <laughs> your time, how you spend your time. Do you feel like um, the, the folks who, uh, the treasurer's job still comes first? Mm -hmm. um, and w talk a little bit about how you balance those things. Sure, yeah. My job comes first and foremost. Uh, and my job to the people of the state of West Virginia is their chief financial officer. That comes first and foremost. It takes precedence over any type of potential political event or anything that I would do. If, um, so that's my first consideration. And then secondarily to that is... Uh, obviously getting my message out and doing some uh, political events but you know i balance those two things but first and foremost comes the treasurer's job which uh you know look we continue to set records in terms of unclaimed property being returned i have more assets under management uh due to the, some of the modernization things that we have done in terms of our investment capabilities mm -hmm. at the treasurer's office than any state treasurer in the history of West Virginia. Uh, I came in with six and a half billion dollars in our uh, consolidated fund, that's a general revenue okay. fund, I invest those dollars. I now have $12 billion. We have nearly doubled that. Uh, and now some of that obviously is tax collections and some of these other things, but it's also some of the uh, <clears throat> policies that we've put forward, like uh, I'll give you an example. So the Economic Development Authority previously was able to lend, uh, borrow money against our general revenue fund. And I thought that was insane. And we got out of that. We changed that in legislation. We no longer do that because we had long-term loans against essentially short-term investments because we were invested in our consolidated fund to stay liquid, obviously in more uh, debt instruments like fixed incomes, right? So. We got out of that, which uh, no longer puts a drag on our general revenue. Uh, we changed the manner in which we can invest money. We had 15% required 
of our gen revenue by law had to be invested in U.S. backed securities, which sometimes perform well, <laughs> a lot of times not so well. We were able to get out of that and give us more flexibility to um, be more diverse in the manner in which we uh, invest, such as things like commercial paper and things like that. And the results have been able to speak for themselves. So running that and then also the Hope Scholarship Program, which we've been able to double that program now and its enrollment um, from last year to this year. And so obviously that job comes first and foremost. Jumpstart Savings Program, we've continued to be able to uh, get more enrollees in there as well. And so I think if you do a good job as state treasurer, then I think some of the rest kind of takes care of itself. Let me follow up on that. Now, this is a question I was going to ask before Maria asked her very insightful question. Uh, you've done quite well uh, as treasurer. You're highly respected and your, your accomplishments are, are meaningful. Of these accomplishments, do you sit back and think one is better than the others with a legacy? If you, if you hang your hat on one particular one for your legacy, which one would that be? I think that would be the Jumpstart Savings Program. I, I do. I think that that has the ability, and that's a program if I am elected to Congress, I'm going to be taking to Congress. I want it to be a federal program. And for those that are not familiar, this is a program that allows individuals that have graduated from trade school, vocational school, to start a savings account, like a college savings account, but not for the courses. It's for after graduation to be able to buy and save for tools, equipment, licenses, certifications, and new business startup costs. I think that will have a lasting, I hope it does, have a lasting legacy. There's other states that want to adopt this. And if I'm elected to Congress, we would literally do it the exact same way with a 529 where you have a federal authorization for it and then the states make the decision of whether they want to uh, opt into that program or not. They don't have to, but if they'd like to, they could do that. I think it's a great way for us to get more people into the trades in this country and not just, you know, welders and pipe fitters and plumbers and things like that, but this could also apply to somebody who went to culinary school, could apply to somebody who went to beautician school or any of these other types of uh, non-college career paths. So that's what I'm hoping uh, has some type of lasting legacy. Riley Moore, our guest, treasurer of the state of West Virginia, candidate for Congress to you, recently came out with an opinion on use of Hope Scholarship funds because uh, there's some, uh, some confusion as to what you can use those funds for and what you can't use them for, Riley. Yes. So on that, and thank you for asking that because there's, I think, been some, um, I wouldn't say misinformation, but perhaps confusion out there on what exactly uh, we were saying and all we were doing is interpreting the law as it is. So if you're a Hope Scholarship student, say you're homeschooled or you go to private school, we'll use homeschool for this example, and you want to take a course, let's say, I don't know, Spanish, you know, ninth grade Spanish, and it it's not offered through your homeschool curriculum, you'd like to take it at the local public school. The public school, the local public school can charge you as a Hope Scholarship student uh, to use their services. A charter school is a public school. It receives public money. If you take a course at a charter school, they can charge you money. Now, what a charter school cannot do, and this is the important part here, they cannot charge tuition. And they can't charge tuition where, you know, you're using Hope Scholarship dollars to, like, pay. They cannot do that. But if you're using, you know, kind of call it a la carte kind of services at a, any public school, um, you know, could be Musselman, could be uh, um, Eastern Panhandle Preparatory Academy or something like that, and you're just taking one class, well, that, that is using a service, and it's taking a seat in there, and so they can charge. So that's what that, that's what that uh, ruling uh, was talking about. Is, during your time as treasurer, is there one thing that you were not able to do? If you were coming in as a treasurer today, is it something you would pursue? You know, yeah, I, I have a few different <laughs> ideas that we weren't, um, that I wasn't able to uh, get to. Uh, maybe a predecessor of mine could be able to do that. Uh, you know, this is like a way down the road kind of project that would take a lot of time and money. 
But uh, in terms of modernizing state government and saving dollars, I'd really like to see, and this would be cutting edge. I mean, there's not a lot of states doing this, but trying to move more towards like a real-time payment system. You know, everything's paid in the rears in the state of West Virginia, but basically every state in America does it like that. But the amount of processing time and things that, that takes place, I mean, you could save so much money and it could also help with people that have to contract with the state of West Virginia, where they have to wait sometimes months to be able to be paid and the services rendered. So then sometimes you have outside contractors providing services that are just like, forget it. I don't want to deal with state government. I just don't want to do it. F trying to figure out a way to move us towards a real-time payment system and where we could be kind of the first mover in the country. I, I think that that would be huge in moving to some type of uh, – almost you know there's a lot of technology blockchain and things like that that are out there that i know some people are kind of scared of some of that but something to that degree where we could be on the cutting edge of technology to be able to do that i i, I it would be wonderful now that's a real long-term kind of project probably cost you quite a bit of money but at the end of the day it would save you so much money uh as a state government i think President Trump recently endorsed Governor Justice he did. for the Senate seat that uh, your, uh, the person you hope to replace, Alex Mooney, uh, is running for as well. Uh, your thoughts on his endorsement of Governor Justice over Alex Mooney? You know, I, I don't think anybody's surprised by it. Uh, you know, Alex had said this, Congressman Mooney had said this several months ago that, you know, he's not going to be surprised if President Trump endorses uh, Governor Jim Justice. And so I take it he was probably not surprised by that. Now, I want to be clear here, President Trump did endorse Alex Mooney in the last election cycle and has been a strong advocate and ally for President Trump over the years, very much so. And so I don't necessarily think it's, uh, you know, and I don't speak for the president, clearly, uh, President Trump, but I don't think this is an endorsement as much against Alex Mooney, but for Governor Jim Justice, if that makes sense. Can we extend this? Uh, do you anticipate that uh, either President Trump or Governor Justice will jump into the race for the governor? Say that one more time, well, sir. I, do you anticipate either Trump or Justice endorsing one of the four candidates for governor? Gosh, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, perhaps, you know, I keep kind of hearing things about that, that that might happen. But I don't know. You know, I, I'm not I'm not sure on that. That's, um, you know, look, I could I'm not looking at my phone right now. I could get on Twitter and Jim or uh, Donald Trump just endorsed somebody for governor. You know, you, yeah, know, yeah. you know, there's it's 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 hard to tell. I wouldn't be surprised. He generally likes to get involved in races in West Virginia because he is so popular here. Um, but I, I guess we'll see, you know, um, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, obviously, uh, Patrick Morrissey was endorsed by President Trump when he ran for United States Senate. Um, does that translate into the gubernatorial race? I don't know. Um, I, I have no idea. Uh, and it did seem that Governor Justice had indicated that he was going to endorse somebody at some point. Uh, he did say that publicly. When? You know, I, I have no idea. And obviously we understand who's popular um, in the state and, and what an endorsement can or can't mean. And I would argue, again, seven months, as you point out, until the primary, it would be not unheard of to do it this early, but, you know, might have um, a stronger implication, stronger meaning a little bit later. But maybe that's, a, that's a good point. You know, uh, once you get past the filing deadline right, and right. you get kind of folks trapped in and... Uh, Come then in with, why? Yeah, then come in with the endorsement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. Riley, term limits for constitutional officers, the remaining constitutional officers, oh, at least in the man. state. That, I, I've run that bill every session. Every session I've run that bill, and I cannot get it passed. And you got the governor and sheriff's term limited here in the state of West Virginia. I absolutely believe constitutional officers like myself 
state treasurer should be term limited. We were so close on that bill in the last session. It died the last night of session. There's a potential, and we've seen this over the years, for a lack of accountability um, from constitutional officers. I'm not talking about any of the current incumbents, but just over the decades, uh, years past. And they're very hard to beat. Uh, you don't take votes. You don't have necessarily a public record, so to speak. You can not be publicly forward uh, facing to the public if you would like to not be. And you can kind of sit there and accumulate power just kind of over time. And I, we've seen a lot of weird things happen in these constitutional offices over the decades. And, I, you know, look, I don't care if they're a Democrat, Republican, whoever they are. Um, I just don't think it's good to have somebody in one of these executive branch offices like state treasurer or secretary of state or whatever it is for 24 years or 20, you know, 20 years or whatever it is. I just don't think that's a good thing. It's interesting in this country what we are in favor of term limit wise and when we're not. We have a term limit for the president, but we don't have it for Congress. In the state, we have a term limit for governor, but we don't have it for the delegates or the senators or the remaining constitutional officers. It's an odd inconsistency. Well, yeah, and it's even more strange where you have it for governor, but not treasurer, attorney general. Right. I mean, we're all on the board of public works. Mm -hmm. I, you know. <laughs> now, the case of sheriff, uh, I think two terms, and they have to sit out, but then they can run again. Well, same for governor. Yeah, you can sit out and run. You can sit out. I, I know a guy that did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a couple guys actually. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ronnie, candidate for Congress, there's nobody close to you in the polls. No. I know that uh, as, as a person who's run for office before, you know better than to take anything lightly or think it's going to be easy. Uh, along the way, you're still going to, I'm sure, work hard and campaign and whatever. But at this point along the way, you have no real competition in the polls for this position. No. West Virginia Statewide News just put out a live caller poll about a week or so ago. Uh, forced response, uh, but it was live caller. So if you're elections today, who are you going to vote for? Uh, I'm at 85 uh, percent. The next person behind me is at six. And then the uh, others were kind of two and one. You've been in the 84, 85, 89 percent range from uh, from day one. Yes. So you've been very consistent with that percentage. Are we are we making you late by keeping you uh, okay no. this past yeah. night? No, no. Uh, real quick question because uh, uh, Nate Kane, one of your uh, one of the people who's also running for the office, tried to associate you with uh, certain liberal think tank groups, and uh, and and yeah. claim that as a result uh, you're also affiliated with Hillary Clinton and not a real true conservative. Yeah. Um, so. What I would tell anybody listening, go ahead and look at my voting record. Go look what I've done as state treasurer if you want to see a true conservative. Um, if, you know, it's a lot of, to me, what he's saying is just misinformation that he has put out there. And I would mention this to you uh, in terms of this claim uh, that he has as a whistleblower for about around this Uranium One thing. Go look up a guy's name. Write this down, William Douglas Campbell. Go ahead and Google that right now. Tell me the first thing that comes up. It'll probably say the Uranium One whistleblower, because that's the real guy. And on that note, Riley, thank you very much for coming in today. All right, you, you thanks wanna, so much for having me. Do you want to drop the mic and walk out after No, that? no. <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much. You have a good one. Thanks, thanks Riley. Too. Very good. Treasurer Riley Moore at 901, and this segment brought to you in part by the Berkeley County Health Department.